Okay, let's get started here. Now that we've got the tech working, that will help. So welcome to our Christmas meeting. Uh, it's a very short agenda because we want lots of time to eat the treats, right? So I want to say welcome to everyone. Is anybody new here today for the very first time? Oh. I don't want to embarrass you. That's not why I'm calling your name or whatever. Um, but we'd like you to uh, tell us your name and the families that you are researching. Wow. Cologne, Germany. Anybody have a German expertise here that no <laughs> Okay. He's the German expert. Anybody have <laughs> German questions? <laughs> During the social, pick his brain. So we did this last month, but I'll do it again. Uh, we're having the Grow Your Family campaign. Is there anyone here? who is wanting to join for the first time, or the first time in at least two years, and needs a sponsor. Okay, I guess I can go on and just mention to please renew your OGS membership. Oh, you might want to say, who wants a sponsor because? <laughs> oh yes, well, if you get a sponsor, both you and the sponsor get 50% off your membership fee. <laughs> It's a really good deal. <laughs> and who is the sponsor? Pardon? We've got sponsors in this room? Lots of sponsors in this room. Anybody who's a member of OGS can sponsor anybody who wants to be a member of OGS. And both of you save 50%. Yes, and I have not renewed, so I'm a sponsor. <laughs> okay. Dan hasn't renewed yet. He's up for grabs. And might fight you for the honor, but... Oh, I thought, what, what happens to the family? I don't think the family... Uh, doesn't work? Doesn't work. So it would have to be me. <laughs> it would have to be Anne. Because <laughs> Anne's the full member and you're the family member? Yes, that's yes. true. Okay. Now that we've got that sorted out, we'll move on. And I've been asked to mention that the nominations committee for OGS is looking for candidates to go on the board, be a member at large, or volunteer to be the president, although the current vice president will probably move up into that position. And, but we need a new vice president and two to four directors at large. So if you are at all interested in uh, taking part in the duties of the Board of Directors of the Ontario Genealogical Society, I don't know. And at any rate, if you, and I spent 12 years on the board, and I can, I can say that you, it's a very good camaraderie working with the people on the board. But if you're interested, you need to send uh, an email to pastpresident at ogs.on.ca. He's the one in charge. Still looks weird. Well, that, that's the presenter set. But that's okay, you can look at my notes while I'm <laughs> clicking through. The problem is, of course, your screen isn't going to be as big as it should be. Is there a way to map? Do you know how to maximize it? What? There's something I think there's one in behind it. Oh, that's right, there is something in behind it. So, yeah. there it goes. So, there you go. <coughs> you fixed it. You fixed it. I put them on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so did that. Is that another know. cable? Um, we need another computer, really. <laughs> that worked last time. Okay. Stay in far away. Yeah, it worked last time. Okay, we're going to 
really well last time. So anyway, we unfortunately we had a director on the OGS board who uh, had to resign uh, due to family issues, and so there was actually an immediate vacancy to go on the board uh, until June the second to finish, finish out her term. I've also had an email from the Irish Palatine Special Interest Group of the OGS to announce their 2018 tour. And I actually have the full email with all the places and the events they're going to take part in. Now, you can ask me what's an Irish Palatine. Well, the Palatines, when they left Germany, the Palatinate area of, or false area of Germany, some of them came directly to America, some went to England, and ended up in Ireland for a generation. And those are the ones that are called Irish Palatines. We have quite a huge group of Irish Palatine descendants in, I believe, up in the Brock Township area of old Ontario County. So, if you're interested, keep the date free. And all the details are up here. And of course, it wouldn't be a meeting without me telling you about the next OGS webinar, which is this Thursday night. And it's about researching English and Welsh ancestors before 1837. And Kirsty's a very good speaker, and I think you'd quite enjoy it. I think the cable's too long, Dan. No, I think it's a bad connection. I've got another cable. You try that. Well, thank you, Dan. I'd also like to mention that Toronto Branch. It keeps flickering in and out on me, too. Yeah. Toronto, Toronto Branch has announced their uh, January, February courses, and they're well worth looking at. Um, I'm going to move this this way so I can read them. There's one on introduction to genetic genealogy. Uh, there's one on putting your family tree online, and that's with Marion Press, who was, one of our, was supposed to be one of our speakers at our workshop day but provided the PowerPoint and all the uh, handouts. And I gave her a lecture, which was an interesting experience. The, there's one on early Ontario land records, a hands-on three-week session. And there's one uh, one-day uh, workshop on introduction to genealogy. So just go to OGS website, click on branches, and click on Toronto branch to see the full details. No, they're, they're from branch members. I believe them. Now, they are very experienced branch members, and, and the uh, three people who are involved in giving those courses have given many courses and many talks over the years at the OGS conference. And they're well worth taking. Okay, because we're not doing a traditional break, we're going to have our complete session and then go to the social gathering. Um, you're getting the announcements now. So in January, we are doing a breaking down brick walls, which is basically a brainstorming session with everybody in the branch. But we'd like you to send in your brick wall now. Steve would like time to do a bit of research ahead. So this is a really good opportunity to get some work on your brick wall done. February, we're going to do DNA basics. And in March, don't you like this title? The Barber, the Bishop, and Lucy. It's one of our members who is also a volunteer at the Clarendon Museums. And he's been doing some research on uh, 
the Black family back in the mid 1800s of Bolandeau, Oshawa, and I believe Coburg. Hmm? Started in Niagara, yes, but ended up with most of the adult career of the barber in Oshawa, Bolandeau, and Coburg. So it's it's going to be just a little bit after Black History Month. But that's okay, this is our Black History Month offering. And then they'll all be here. The DNA Special Interest Group is two weeks tomorrow, the 20th. They voted and they still want to meet. But they're going to meet a half hour earlier than usual. We're going to try a 7 o'clock start time. And that's up at the Durham Branch Office, a south field of the airport. Is it be here? No correspondence then. I know that Sheila's here. Did you want to do a report? Awesome. So from a month ago, um, the deposits were $169.78, withdrawals $983.21, and our current balance is $3,845.29. Did you have a chance to look at our workshop figures by any chance? They are, they are even. Oh, we, we broke, broke even, even on the workshop. workshop. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get, and we'll get maybe, I don't know, we'll get $40, $50 back with an HST. Okay, so then when we get our HST rebate, we'll get actually make a little bit of a profit. I'll let Bea take her coat off first. <laughs> Did you have correspondence for us, no. Okay, well that answers that question. Did you bring treats? <laughs> now before we actually start the program, our friend Bob has calendars for everyone. They're on the back table. Help yourself. Take one for all your kids. Yep. <laughs> One for your cottage, <laughs> several for your neighbors. It, it looks like he brought loss. Yep. yep. <laughs> I've got the thousand. <laughs> okay. So, so we're going to do bring and brag or show and tell. But so while we're doing it, I'm going to leave that up there so that you have the email address to send in the brick wall problem. Okay. So, so we're going to start, start with the first person on the list. Who, got, who, who put their name on the list first? I did. Okay. okay. I'm happy to be standing next to you. Just <laughs> over here. So I thought that I had uh, pretty well lined my parents' house for for everything that was in there, but no. <laughs> um, Dan um, brought home a box of photographs to scan, and when he took out the photographs, underneath was this. And it just has a little collection of interesting things in it that I didn't know were in my parents' house, but sometimes you think uh, doing genealogy, you're looking for things that were centuries ago. But of course, you're still responsible for keeping track of things from your own parents and grandparents um, so that you can pass them along. And also, if you're a person who's uh, going to be writing up family stories, um, sometimes you want things that aren't um, just documents, births, marriages, and deaths. So here are some of the things that were in this bottom of this box that I found. Um, my Aunt Violet was a public trustee. And when she retired, for her retirement, they gave her a certificate of competence 
because one of her jobs was to make certificates of incompetence so because the public trustee um, manages estates for people that can't manage their own. So they, they made her uh, a, a, a certificate of competence and the fa facts that proved she was competent was she bought a mink coat, she retired voluntarily, <laughs> and um, anyway, so uh, it's all signed here by your boss and in 1979. So. <laughs> um, here's some, something that I didn't know existed either. This is a, a, a memory book from the funeral of my younger brother who, who died when I was five. So um, inside it, it's got all kinds of genealogical information. This is baptismal certificate. And the names of all the, uh, it's got a little family record sheet in there. And then the names of all the uh, people who came, and which ones were relatives, and bearers, which ones were friends, and that sort of thing. So, um, you might not, you might not think, you know, when a, a grandparent dies, you know, you might think something like this, but he didn't realize it was one for a little baby. And you might not think that Hurricane Hazel would have victims a year after the hurricane. Yes. My, my little brother uh, drowned in a pool that hadn't been there until Hurricane Hazel came along and, and made, a, made an extra pond. <laughs> and then, then I found my grandfather's discharge from World War II. Oh, cool. Yes. Apparently he was 40 and that was too old. So. They let him go. <laughs> um, my mother's a certificate saying that she was a member of the Little Light Bearers of the Women's Missionary Society. <laughs> a, a slide picture of my uncle. I didn't know they had slides this size. In color. It's, it's in color. A color slide from 1948. I've never seen one of those before. <laughs> My grandfather's service book. Um, it te tells all the way, all the places he was assigned and the courses he took and stuff like that. My mother's um, public school record. <laughs> all these things I didn't know were there. Um, the confirmation of the reservation for my parents' honeymoon cottage. That's <laughs> cool. And uh, graduation from high school for my mother. Uh, this is an article in the newspaper about my great uncle Sam, who, who lived to be 101. And um, it's a newspaper article um, telling about how he had to be in the uh, in the bantams because he was only five feet tall and he couldn't march with the big boys. Last week, and and this is what I meant when I was thinking. Okay, so if you're going to write up a story for, about a parent, for instance. This is all the things that my father, their certificates for all the things that courses he took, the things he was doing. He was one of these people that was a little bit into everything. So here's his, his uh, amateur radio certificate and, uh, and, a, and license. And this is his Intercontinental Electronic School Certificate for Stereo and Radio Electronics Repair Course. He was a water treatment plant operator for the Village of Hastings and a water pollution control plant operator for the Village of Hastings. And it, it, it can tell you what years he did that. Um, this is his electrical trades and construction and maintenance graduation certificate. Okay. 
Alliance, Alliance Club, Club membership. membership. Uh, small, small engine repairs. repairs. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's probably it. Anyway, so if, if I was going to write about my dad having this stuff, it would really help because I would, I would know what, what years he got involved in those things. And I can't ask him now, so. That's it. I'll call up Nick. Okay, I'll bring my box with me. Okay. Well, I, uh, some of you know my mother was adopted. Her, oh, her uh, parents were very, uh, they're from Exeter, Ontario. And my, uh, my family, uh, scattered when, when I was about 15. 15. I went to live with different relatives and all this. And all my stuff that I had, because I was a little historian when I was a child, went. Except for the stuff I had in a bag. And a little bit of the stuff that my mother gave me and my father gave me throughout the years. But I tell you, uh, a lot of stuff was lost. The divorce is lousy that way. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we were going to uh, put it on tables and just uh, stand by it and all that. So I brought uh, several things, but uh, the one thing I just wanted to... Does anybody know what this is? I know it's hard to see. Well, it's a... It's a hanger. <laughs> <laughs> um, my grandfather, Grand Grandpa Powell, um, he was an inventor. He was also a merchant. He owned an Edison shop. Back then they used to call him mercantile. Anyways. Mercantile? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So anyways, uh, I have pictures of uh, uh, his, his uh, store and a little bit, and uh, the Edison records. We used to have several Edison uh, phonographs and different things. And uh, anyways, they went with the divorce, of course, and I even get in. But my, one of the things my, my grandfather had back in the early 1900s was a company. It was called the Purity Manufacturing Company. Now, of course, he had all the rights and the, the name and everything like that. But with his, in, in his inventions in that, he invented uh, Sano uh, Cream, which was a soap without water. They didn't have to use water. That was back in the early 1900s. He invented many other things. I have the uh, formulas and many of the things that he invented and some really weird ones. I had a book uh, about 25 years ago. Uh, my house was broken into and that book with all the ingredients went along with the uh, silver watch, uh, pocket watch, other things. But you do lose those things. Um, and then the, the main thing that he did have was an ointment. It was similar to this, but you've got to figure he invented this back in the early 1900s, late 1800s maybe, and it was called nameless. Nameless ointment because he couldn't think of a name. So I just read a little bit, and these are the, as far as I know, the only remaining remnants of the anus. <laughs> this one is uh, that's pretty full. Well, it just reminds me of my childhood. My parents used to boil the stuff in the basement. <laughs> they had a little room and they, they uh, made up the ointment because uh, I have, 
I have the document here in this little book that says um, my grandmother handed over the business to my parents. And all it is is on a page. And uh, anyways, this ointment, I just want to tell you about this. Um, this here was uh, for $2. Now, the, the bottle now would be probably worth more than two dollars. But uh, the ingredients uh, are, are really interesting. I used to have the ingredients at home, but uh, I threw them out because uh, I gave them to the drugstore, actually. Because I didn't want that stuff around because it was different uh, chemicals. But anyways, uh, it says, try it on mosquito and bee stings burns, sore hands and feet, use a little and often, rub it in gently, keep cover on tight. Well, I used to use this as a child. So when I smell that, it brings me back to my childhood. Um, that, my parents uh, used to sell a couple things uh, from my grandfather. And uh, the soap was one, and uh, the ointment. And there was uh, one other thing I can't remember. But they used to send this throughout the world. They used to get, there's a, a, a postcard in here that from somebody from, from, I don't know, in Canada. But I've come across uh, postcards and, and, and other information from New Zealand, from England, from Spain, and many other countries. So this bottle was sent. They would say, I would like, and some were, uh, uh, he got uh, letters from uh, people for arthritis and that, doctors. He had at least 10 doctors that sent for this stuff they want, 10 bottles of this size, and maybe 10 balls of this size, different things like that. It was quite a business at the time. My parents took it over in 1959, uh, uh, two years after my grandfather passed away. But uh, uh, it, it was just, I was the baby of the family, and I missed them a lot. My, my uh, brothers and sisters, they uh, they knew my grandparents really good and all this, but I did. I was I was uh, um, under ten when everybody died, so I lost them a lot. I I should have been the one that was the oldest, so I could could uh, get to meet them in that. Um, another thing that I I just said. Remember toothache gum? Now this is for my grandparents. That's how old it is, and. Uh, it's from a store at Wyandotte and Dougal in Windsor. I know Wyandotte right? and Dougal. <laughs> but I tell you, I'm a, I'm a visual person and a sense person. And a, I go like that, and I remember my childhood when I used to use this stuff because I had bad teeth. What is that? It's toothache gum, they call it. And uh, there's little things like that that... Um, if you look at this, you know, railroad spike, right? Well, my other grandfather was was on the railroad. He ran between Havelock and Windsor, and uh, so just this, nothing to most people, but to me, I look at that and I think of my grandfather. I think the railroad. My 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 uncle died on the railroad, so I have that. Um, there's our famous square now. You mm -hmm. like grandfather had. Um, I got all kinds of things. I got. Uh, I'll just leave them up here. There's postcards here. Uh, if, if people are interested in postcards, I love the war ones that my grandfather sent my grandmother, and uh, the linen on the front, and uh, and and the messages. You know, like there's of course one with the linen on the front. And sometimes there was pockets where you, they put notes and stuff like this. This, but, would, uh, this would be World War One then. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah my grand, yeah, wow. yeah. And I had 
a, a great uncle that died in World War One too. I have one of those big, what do you call those things? There we go. That's what I got. Um, so I have a lot of documents and, and uh, pictures and different things here uh, that relate to my grandfather. Um, this year is a just a oh, lighter. old lighter yeah. from my grandfather, and it, uh, I haven't tried it lately, but it did spark. It used to spark on it. Um, this here is a, a trick, uh, like there's oh, yes. a cross there. <laughs> I you, remember one of those, yeah. yeah. You go like this, you know, and you open it up, and oh, there's the cross there now. But it's, it's a simple one, but it, it was great for us kids. Oh, yeah. And, and I, um, just so, this is an old, well, old because I got it when I was probably 14. <laughs> I'm not a stamp and coin collector, not, not a, a expert in them, but, you know, I have a bit of, a bit of coins and stamps. In 1964, I think it was, my dad was campaign manager for one of the people that were running for member of provincial parliament. Well, I helped out, and I was the type of guy that kid that would run forever. So I used to hand out a lot of pamphlets and that. Anyways, the, the fellow name was Fred Burr from Windsor, and he won, and um, he gave me this for helping him out. It was like gold to me. And I've had it all this time and I still use it, it's still dirty. But uh, um, I, I really, that's part of my history. Part of something I did and that. And I've written that up. And I've got to get out of here so everybody else can do it. This is just a, a gold watch from, from uh, Exeter that my grandfather had and that was left to me. I did have a couple more, but they were stolen uh, actually about 12 years ago. I had house broken in twice on that. So anyways, uh, there's all kinds of, oh, one more thing. I just wanted to show you this. I don't know if I showed this before, but this is the government at work. My mother was adopted. What did I do? I sent for for any information they had. They sent me all these pages. Like, I think it was the, the yeah, I don't know. National Security. <laughs> but this is the government. They, they, they put the, all this cost. I don't know how much they spent on it, but it was not worth The only, there was one piece of information that I found out that my grandmother lied to them a bit because <laughs> he put it in one of the letters and she she did the bit <laughs> so hopefully uh hopefully uh she didn't fit too much because i found found her in the welcome uh, cemetery so anyways thank you Just pull that down. Yeah. Way, way down. down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have not anything to show, but I have a message. Okay. Here's the going to be a little closer. Okay, I, I have a message, and that is, I want you to use your family resources. The first thing I have to tell you is that I had, through my DNA, a contact with an Atkinson Boyd family member, and my nephew and I, who of course know everything between us, we decided that the most probable source of this adopted child was the cousin 
who was a race horse man, has spent a lot of his time crossing over the border from from um, BC to Washington and spending a couple of months at the race courses. However, during this time, another cousin from that family that I knew because she'd come and visit me, she had a DNA done and she had an even better match with this adopted person. So I got in touch with her and I said, this is what we have and I want you to be very circumspect about this. And she said, right. She said, I shall ask my uncle. Now you have to realize that I'm a lady. My relatives who are helping me with my DNA, apart from my youthful nephew of 68, are also elderly. And this cousin is elderly. So her uncle was more elderly. <laughs> so we knew the name of the mother of this person, which we shared. So our Sandra got in touch with her uncle. And he said, oh, he says, no, he said, you got it all wrong. He said, I remember that girl. She was in school with my son. So we have proof now, of course, because we caught up with the son, and he has been made done, and he, of course, is the father of the child. And they have met, and they have had a very happy reunion. Not so much, I don't think, for his wife, but <laughs> the, the point in here is that if you have 90-year-old relatives, for God's sake, lose them before you lose them. Yes. And the other one that is of interest was a person who I met through my work, and he was contacted by the Children's Aid, and he was told that some young woman was looking for him because she thought he was her father. So there was a record years ago of this young woman's birth, and sure enough, he's written down as the father. But the children said when they got in touch with him, he said, no, no, not me. And uh, so the children said very tactfully asked if he could have fathered a child with a certain woman. And he was honest enough to say, yes. So. After a lot of hearing and hawing and discussing what kind of tragedies this might cause if it was revealed, he decided to get in touch with the brother of the person who had with me, the child. And he put him on to her current family. So to make a short story of it, he got in touch with one of the daughters of her, of her legitimate family. And she said, oh, I never heard anything about that but leave it with me. So half an hour later, he got a phone call back, and she said, yes, you're right. My mother did have an illegitimate child before she married my father. And he said very quietly, do you mind telling me how you found out so quickly? And she said, I asked my grandmother. <laughs> and it, came to light that he and, he and the girl had an argument and, and he took off to the war or whatever and he wrote to her but her parents didn't approve of him so, so they intercepted the letters so, so he never received a letter back from this young woman who was carrying his child and when he came back he didn't make any effort to get back with her and he carried on and and new relationship, got married, and had children, and I'm not going to it. But, but don't, don't forget to ask grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you get it? In our, in our office. office. <laughs> 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 
Has used by been used by brides in my family for six generations of women. And Dally Gale was Alma Gould, Mary Tom Dale. She was a Quaker minister. She kind of left her husband and went off on missions out in Manitoba and New Zealand and ended up in Norfolk, England, and raising horses for the British Army in the First World War. Very colorful woman. Now, now the, the necklace, necklace actually starts, starts with my grandmother. grandmother. It's, it's Alva Gould Wilkins' wedding pearl necklace, October 1920. Let's get this in order. Worn by Alice Wilkins Federley Brown, September 9, 1950, when she married my father. Uh, like I said, I have to get this in order. Worn by Judith Wilkins Ryan, November 16, 1974, that's my first cousin. Worn by me, October 15, 1977. Susan Brown McLennan, October 3, 1981, that's my sister. And then she started on the sticky notes. Silk Hanky to Nicole, that's my niece. July 5th, 2003, but she doesn't need the necklace. So there you have it. History in a box, four to six generations. B has something to show. Wood and he, he was also from Gordonwood, so they, uh, they 
Yeah. And, and died, who died there. In fact, I know when he died, I do not know yet when she died because it was either 1832 or 1834, and it hasn't come up on uh, any of the statistics yet. So I can't find out. So this is my father's. father's their daughter, daughter married my, my William Wilkes, Wilkes. Okay. And, and my father, my father is, is William Gerald Wilkes. Wilkes, and then I see Wilkes. And came all the way down to four generations back. It was an amazing yeah. photograph. I'm sure, I'm sure it was taken in the 1800s because he died in 1911. <coughs> it looks like they're fairly... I think, they're I think they're stylized in the distance, and I've got some other photos that are uh, just just ones from, the ones from the camera, and they're not nearly as um, clear as these are. Is anybody inspired to come up and tell us another story? Bob. Bob. Just to follow, Just follow up on contacting people. There's no excuse anymore for not contacting people. This is sort of unrelated. But uh, aside, uh, I'm a ham radio operator too, so I got to look at that ham radio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a friend of mine just went down to South America. Um, uh, realized they forgot the prescriptions here. up here. And so, and so just before the meeting, I get a call uh, on, uh, WhatsApp. on WhatsApp. They don't have, they don't have phone, phone service where they are. They, they, are. they don't have internet, internet. But, they've the but they've got the cell phone, phone with them. To went to Wi-Fi spot, spot, spot. Use WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Called me. I took a it went over to their house and got a key and took a picture of a pill bottle for them and emailed it back so that they could get a prescription down there. But it's, it's, it's a small bill, global village. I, it, it, when they called me, they told me where the medicine was. And of course, it wasn't where they said it was. And so I, I had to go in, um, phone them back from the house and say, okay, I'm in this room, I'm in this room, and we finally found it. But it really is a small world. We really don't, really don't have an excuse not to contact my grandparents and elderly people. That, um, and I've had the same thing. My grandmother, my grandmother once told me uh, we, should uh, we should try to contact this one lady, uh, first cousin of my uh, grandmother's, grandmother's father, father, and contact her children, it would be roughly my grandmother's age. And this was when my grandmother was in her 80s. And, and we started looking for the um, children. children. We end up, we end up finding, finding out his mother was still alive at 105. <laughs> you, you, you just <laughs> never know. <laughs> wow.
Lars already looked at the lighting, so they're stuck on the lighting. Yeah, I hear number two. Say the Lars. Put them up to the ceiling. Our ceiling is very close. Yeah. Uh, just, just barely, the door goes up and just barely clears the ladders above. Well, we had a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had a little bit of a band here. We had